Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Well, this July is the 50th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 11, and along with that, uh, I've been given the honor of participating in Project Egress. So what's going on here is Adam Savage and Savage Industries, uh, in association with the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian, are putting together a model of the Apollo 11 Egress hatch. And uh, so Adam is going to be putting this thing together live, and uh, all of us makers are collaborating to make parts for this model. So the parts don't have to be functional, uh, so we can use any kind of material or process that we want to make them, whatever speaks to us. And hey, this is Blondie Hacks, so you know we're going to machine it. And uh, no CNC here, this is going to be all manual. Okay, let's dive in. Okay, here is the part that the fine folks at the Smithsonian and Savage Industries have tasked me with making. It's called Top 3, and uh, it looks kind of like a turnbuckle. There's a square clevis at one end that's threaded into a longer shaft, and uh, the real piece de resistance on this part is that spherical bearing at the end. Now, the drawings call for making that spherical bearing from scratch, uh, but I've actually got a, a trick for how to do that that uh, I will show you in a moment. So here's what I'm going to use to make it. This is a nice piece of 6061 aluminum round bar. It's nice and spacey and in keeping with the theme of this project. And uh, we're going to start with the more complex part, which is the long kind of rod end of the turnbuckle with the spherical bearing in the end. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and chuck this up in the lathe and face off the end as is tradition. And those stringy chips are kind of a preview of things to come. Now we're going to need tail support here because this is going to be some long thin turning and uh, so I'm going to center drill here and uh, set up my uh, tail stock for tail support. And I'm going to blue up one end here and uh, mark off my overall length just so I know kind of what my working space is. And now I can square up my tool post and get ready to do some turning. A little bit of cutting fluid on there. Now on this first cleanup pass you can see that I'm uh, getting kind of a lousy surface finish there so I haven't uh, haven't got my speeds and feeds dialed in yet so uh, we'll be experimenting a little bit more with that here shortly. And as you can see from this rat's nest chip I still do not quite have my speeds and feeds right but don't worry we will get it sorted out as you can see here now we're getting some good chip action. Aluminum on the lathe is, is pretty tricky. It really likes to make those long stringy chips. So my first goal is to turn the whole part down to the largest diameter, which is the outer diameter of the spherical bearing end of the part. Even though that's going to be flat, I can remove the bulk of that material here on the lathe. And now that I've got the whole part to that diameter, I can go ahead and blue it up and mark all of my changes in diameter. So I've got the big spherical bearing at one end and then the uh, kind of medium sized end at the other and then the skinny section in the middle. This is kind of a barbell shaped part. So I'm turning the that whole lower section down to the diameter of the next largest which is the stubby end where the uh, square clevis threads in. So my uh, speeds and feeds are finally cooperating here. I'm getting some decent chip action and some decent surface finishes. Now I'm going to turn down the uh, skinny barbell section in the middle and to do that I'm using a parting tool to cut in uh, on the shoulder so that I have some clearance for getting my tool in there because I need to be able to turn down the middle. So uh, plunge cutting with that parting tool gives me clearance at one end so I can get my tool in there to do my turning. Now I'm aiming for 390 on this middle section. I'm about half a thou over, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and take that. This middle diameter here isn't critical, and I am not one to look a gift half thou in the mouth. Next up, we're going to bevel the ends of the stubby section as per the drawing. So I've got my 90 degree chamfer tool in here. I'm just going to give those guys a nice beautiful little chamfer. Nothing says machined like chamfers. All right, switch up now to the parting blade because we are done with the lathe work for this part. So I pulled out my tailstock, and 
and Yahtzee. Now I need to flip the part end for end so I can do the uh, the blind tapped hole at the other end where the clevis screws in. So switching the chucks out now, I've got my four jaw going in here with my copper soft jaws, which is a good setup for a second operation. It never hurts to put a board down on the ways in case you drop the chuck. So this hole in the bottom is an M6-1 thread. So I'm tapping here with the tapping size for M6-1, which is a five millimeter. And then I go in here with my M6 tap. And then a little deburring, make it all look nice and pretty. Looking good. Over to the mill now. This is the first of several challenging setups with this part. Uh, because it's a barbell shape, it's actually pretty difficult to hold. The barbell section in the middle is too small for my V-blocks uh, for any, or any sort of traditional round part holding systems. And because it's a barbell shape, I can't get it in a collet. So what I did is I went ahead and made a, uh, a, a V-block out of some scrap and I made it out of aluminum so it wouldn't mar up the part. And then on the near side, uh, I've got a, a machined square block to take up the space on the other side and I put a little copper shim in there that compresses with the vise and kind of helps hold that part nice and snug and then I'm just centering it up with the edge finder there. Now with that thing centered I can go ahead and machine the flats on either side of this big end which is going to form the uh, spherical bearing here eventually and with both those sides machined flat it's starting to look like the beginnings of that part. Now onto that spherical bearing. Now you can certainly make a spherical bearing in situ if you have the right tooling, but it's a pretty challenging thing to do. Now what you can, however, do is buy press in spherical bearings. Because spherical bearings are hard to make, it's a common problem. Uh, they sell pre-made ones that you can buy and press into your part. Now the challenge here is that there is no store-bought spherical bearing that has the ID of six millimeter and the OD of 15 millimeter or 630 thou that I needed for my part. There wasn't any wiggle room in the design for that spherical bearing end to be any larger to accept a full-size uh, stock spherical bearing. So what I'm going to do is uh, modify one. So I've bought a larger one and I'm going to machine it down to fit into the space that I have. Now there is just enough excess material here that I can do this. When I'm done, there will be two millimeters of aluminum on the barbell part and one millimeter of steel remaining around the spherical bearing part. Now that's not a whole lot of strength, but this is, remember, just a decorative piece uh, for the uh, Apollo 50 project. So. Uh, how do I go about machining this spherical bearing? Because there's no way to hold on to it. I can't use a mandrel down the middle because it's a bearing and uh, that little ball in the middle pivots in all directions and spins freely. So there's nothing to hold on to in the center and I can't hold it by the outside because I need to machine that. So what I'm doing is I've made a sacrificial arbor and I'm super gluing the bearing to that arbor. And then what I do is I indicate on the surface of the bearing to get that true. And that will mean that my arbor has a bit of run out in it. It's gonna wobble, but that's fine as long as what I'm machining is running true. And then I pin that in place with the tail stock. And then once that glue sets, now I can go ahead and machine that guy. And I give the chuck a little spin just to self-center it a little bit on the arbor. Now, I, this arbor is sacrificial, it's mild steel, so I go ahead and machine myself some runout area for this next step. And now I can start machining down the, the OD of the bearing. And I'm taking very light passes because it's only held there with super glue, and I'm using a lot of cutting fluid. That's really important uh, because the enemy of all glue is heat, and so it's crucial that this part not get too warm. If the part gets too warm, the glue is gonna break loose, and all bets are off. So I'm machining this. Very gently, light passes, lots of cutting fluid, keep that temperature down. Now I need 630 thou exactly, and this dimension has to be dead nuts on because there is no wiggle room in the aluminum part. I have to hit exactly that dimension. So uh, I've got it half thou over right now, and I don't want to press my luck on the lathe, so I'm going to go ahead and use some emery cloth and bring it down that last half thou. Of course, always cover your ways when using any kind of stone-based tools because that grit will scratch up and damage your ways. Let's see how we did. 630 thou, dead nuts on. Beautiful. And now we can just take our sacrificial arbor over the bench, apply some heat, and that glue breaks free. Now we need to make the hole in the aluminum part that will accept that bearing. So I've got it set up in my V-block arrangement again, and I'm indicating it flat to make sure that top surface is horizontal. 
And uh, I've got a bit of a janky setup here, but uh, this is what I needed to do. So there's a one, two, three block uh, and a machinist jack. And then on top of the machinist jack is a piece of sacrificial scrap that is uh, machined parallel top and bottom and uh, then uh, a, a clamp holding everything together. So that, uh, that sacrificial scrap is uh, gonna be necessary as you'll see here shortly. And then I use the edge finder to find the far end of the part because the drawing specifies the exact distance that the center of my bearing needs to be from the far end of the part. So once I found that end, then I can use the digital readout on the mill to find the exact place where my hole needs to go. And then I center up left and right with the edge finder there. And now I go in with my center drill, but I'm just kissing it. And the reason is uh, the, set, the location of this hole is really critical because not only does it have to be the right distance from the end of the part, but there's zero wiggle room on either side. There's uh, only two millimeters of material uh, when I'm done on both sides of this hole. So if I don't get that hole dead nuts on, one of the sides is gonna be too thin and possibly not strong enough. So the reason that I've just kissed it with the center drill is because I wanna have a sanity check on my location. So with that little center drill, now I can go in there with a compass and scribe out the circle uh, to the right uh, diameter. And uh, now I can just kind of visually check and make sure that uh, I've got everything in the right place. And furthermore, as I do the subsequent operations to make this hole, I can see as the edges of the hole approach uh, my scribe line there that uh, things are lining up correctly and then I can make adjustments before it's too late as I approach that line. And then back in with the center drill for realsies now. And now I can start hogging out the bulk of the material with drills. And I'm working my way up slowly in a lot of sizes because my, my setup here isn't super, super rigid. I don't want to stress it with too much tool pressure. And uh, so I'm going up slowly in drill size. So I went up to half inch with the drills, but now I need to get the final size hole. And uh, for that, we can't rely on drills. Uh, this Again, this hole needs to be dead nuts on 630 thou. I don't want to do a press fit as this bearing is intended for uh, because again, there's only going to be two millimeters of aluminum there and I don't want to stress that too much. So I'm going to go for a perfect RC2 fit and I'm going to Loctite it in place. And so for a perfect RC2 fit, there's really only one way to do that and that's with the boring head. So if you've never seen a boring head before, it's rather like someone described a lathe over the telephone to an alien and that alien then went off and made a lathe in the stupidest way possible. Uh, it, so it works the same way as a lathe except that the stock remains still and the entire tool post of the lathe spins around the work. It's goofy and it looks silly while you're doing it, uh, but uh, much like the lathe, when you need an absolutely perfectly dimensioned round thing, the boring bar is your friend. And in this case, we need a, a, a dead nuts on 630 thou hole. And so this is how we're gonna do it. So hence the name, this guy takes boring bars and uh, there's an offset hole in the base of that guy. And there's a little dovetail that slides in and out. And so you can adjust that dovetail for the diameter of the boring operation that you need to do. And much like the lathe, the first thing you do is touch off on the surface, which you can do by hand. And then you dial in a little bit of offset and down you go. And here's a little close up so you can see how beautiful that finish is. Boring heads do a really, really beautiful job. They leave a perfectly finished and perfectly dimensioned hole. And then much like the lathe, after each pass, you go a little further and then down we go again. Boring is precise, but it is not fast. So that's why you hog out as much as you can with the drill ahead of time. And you can see here that I'm feeding with the quill. You can also feed with the column or the knee, depending on your mill. But because this is, these are light passes in aluminum, feeding with the quill is fine. Again, I'm taking light passes because uh, this is not a very rigid setup and this isn't a very strong material. I don't want to push my luck. Now, when I think I'm getting close, I go in there with the snap gauge to get the diameter of that hole. And then I measure the snap gauge with my micrometer. And we still got a few thou to go. All right, one more finishing pass and a quick test fit with my bearing. And it's very, very close. It's close enough that I feel comfortable taking it out of the vise and test fitting on the bench. And you can see that it, uh, it doesn't quite go all the way in. I've got just a tiny bit of taper or there's a little bit of a, a burr or something in the bottom of that hole. So uh, I'm gonna go in here with a, uh, a tapered Swiss file and I just clean up that hole a little bit. And now that is a perfect, perfect fit. Next, we need to uh, round off the ears of that guy uh, because again, the drawing calls for the outer uh, perimeter of this part to be round. And so for that, I'm gonna use this small rotary table. And the first step in setting up a rotary table on the mill is to indicate it in. And so you use a dial test indicator 
and uh, you check it in all four dimensions and make small adjustments of the position of the mill table until that guy reads zero all the way around and then you know that your rotary table is centered exactly under your spindle. You can use fancy tools like co coaxial indicators or other things to do this, but this is the low budget way, uh, just a mirror and a dial test indicator, or in a pinch, your cell phone on selfie mode. And then we need to clamp our part to the rotary table and indicate in the part to get it centered on the table. So I always start with the dial test indicator above the part, just so I know once I'm in the ballpark, and uh, proceed with the same indicating that you saw earlier. Now we can go ahead and mill the sides of our part round. And now uh, you can see I've got the part suspended above the mill table on some sacrificial shims because I need to be able to mill the entire side of it there. And uh, I'm always turning the table clockwise so that uh, I'm conventional milling and not climb milling. And working a rotary table is much like uh, working the compound on your lathe. There's kind of a, a two-handed technique uh, that you want to do to try to keep that rotation smooth. Now, unfortunately, uh, I had intended to do uh, all 270 degrees of that rounded end on the rotary table setup but uh, there wasn't enough space with my fixture to get in around the spindle on the mill, unfortunately, so I wasn't able to go all the way around. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish up with some files on the bench to get the undersides of those guys nice and round. So it won't look quite as nice as the machined top does, but uh, it'll give it a little bit of an artisan feel. Now we're ready to glue the bearing in place. So I'm very carefully putting glue in just a couple of spots because there are oil holes on the bearing and we really don't wanna get Loctite into those. So I just ease that guy in there and wipe away the excess, of course being very careful not to get Loctite in the uh, swivel of the bearing itself. Uh, Loctite 603 is amazing stuff. Once it cures, uh, you will never ever be able to get that bearing out. And to clean up my file work and uh, dial in the shape there a little bit, uh, I'm using my uh, Dremel drill press attachment as kind of an improvised spindle sander. And uh, this actually worked out really, really well. So with that part done, let's go ahead and make the square clevis now for the other end. So one end is kind of a square fork and the other end is threaded M61. So once again, we start on the lathe with our 6061 round bar and I'm gonna face off the end and center drill to set up for tail support once again. And once again, I'm turning the outer diameter to the largest diameter of the entire part, which is the hypotenuse of the cross section of that square section. So we've got quite a ways to go. Turn in, turn in, turn in, keep that metal turning. Now that I've hit that largest diameter, I can blue and mark up my dimensions for my diameter changes once again. And now we can turn down the uh, skinny part where the threads are gonna go all the way down to six millimeters. Now we're onto the finishing pass here and you might notice that the end where the tail support is is kind of flared out. And that's because I couldn't get the tool bit in there close enough without touching the, the live center. And so here's a little trick when you when you can't quite get to the end on your last couple of passes, just uh, go ahead and flip the tool post around at the very end and uh, you can just kind of blend that area in uh, with the rest of the diameter. And now we can part this guy off. And Yahtzee. Over to the mill now. I did not cut the threads on this part yet because I wanted to be able to hold it in a collet block as you see here. And once again, we can mill the flat sides that are gonna form the fork. And the setup is once again, a little sketchy, but uh, it did work out actually very well. Now, when I went to mill the backside, there wasn't room for that clamp anymore. So uh, I set up uh, an indicator stand as a little bit of a backstop against uh, the tool pressure and I just took lighter passes and it was fine. Now here's where things went a little bit awry. I thought I could just use this same setup uh, to mill the top and bottom flat. But uh, in fact, uh, if you think about it, the way that end mill is spinning, the tool pressure here is, well, gonna do that. Yeah, I should have seen that coming. So I set it up in a much simpler and more logical way in the vise. Now, wait a minute. If you're really astute, you may have just noticed something. Not only did I change my setup here, but the part got thicker. What happened there? Yeah, so I often screw up that math where you have to turn a diameter that can contain a rectangle. Uh, I often use, I forget to use the hypotenuse uh, instead of the long dimension of the rectangle. So uh, I actually, uh, on the lathe, made that large diameter too small, and I didn't realize it until this moment. So, yeah, 
it happens. I buckled up and made the part again. And with the power of YouTube, we're right back where we were, and I can mill the top and bottom of the area that will form the fork. And I'll clean up the end while we're here. And I always like to do a spring pass in the climb milling direction just to leave a nice finish. All right, I indicated in once again, and now we can drill the hole that's gonna go through. I've got a sacrificial parallel underneath it here so that I can just drill straight down through the part. And uh, that's again, once again, a, just a machined scrap of aluminum that will act as a parallel. Now I was gonna set up to mill the fork uh, outboard as you see here, and I had set it up in the collet block and uh, I was indicating it flat. And then I remembered what happened uh, with the part when I tried to mill the top and bottom. Decided, you know, this collet block is really not strong enough uh, to hold it in this position against uh, these, these milling forces. I think one of the main reasons is that it's a six millimeter shaft and I don't have metric collets. So I'm using a quarter inch collet, which is really too small. And so the collet is, uh, is a bit overstretched and it's not gripping properly. Properly. So uh, yeah, this, this setup is, is not very rigid. So instead uh, I used my head and I went back to the vise and set it up with my uh, sacrificial parallel underneath once again. And this of course was a very straightforward milling operation. So uh, yeah, it never hurts to uh, stop and think uh, about your setup before you uh, start milling. And the DRO was the secret here to getting my uh, slot the perfect depth with a really nice inside finish. I just had to stop the mill in exactly the same place each time. Now at this point, I've got the center channel cut out and I just need to uh, mill sideways a little bit to widen it out. And there's our final fork. It's looking good. Now back over to my improvised spindle sander uh, to round off the corners. This doesn't need to be super precise, so I didn't want to set up the rotary table all over again just for this, so I did it this part by hand and then cleaned it up on some emery paper. And now we can take it back over to the lathe and set it up in the fore jaw once again to cut the threads on this guy. And then I just go in there with an M6 die and cut those threads. And then to get right up to that shoulder, I flip the die over and do another pass. And the last thing I want to do is shape the underside of this clevis to just give it a more of a svelte appearance. So I started off by tapering it using uh, the compound. And uh, this was in pretty close to the chuck here, but I was able to get in there. And uh, I did have to rearrange the tool post a couple of times to get some different angles. And then once I had a basic taper in there, I uh, came back in with a round nosed form tool and just kind of came in and uh, I wanted to give it more of a, a concave uh, profile. So I just, uh, I just freehanded this with the hand wheels until uh, I had a shape that uh, I thought was kind of satisfying. And I was of course battling chatter here with a, a round nose zero rake tool like that in aluminum, but uh, I think the final result is pleasing enough. And there's our two parts and here's some final assembly. That's all there is to it. But now the moment of truth, after all that effort, did I hit my dimensions? The drawing specifies that the two holes need to be 140.3 millimeters apart when the uh, assembly is all together. And how did we do? Dead nuts on. Whew. Well, this project was a ton of fun and uh, I wanna thank Adam Savage and all the folks, fine folks at Savage Industries and the Smithsonian and the Air and Space Museum for allowing me to participate in this amazing, amazing project. So go ahead and check out hashtag Project Egress and hashtag Apollo 50 to see all the other great makers that participated in this amazing project. Thank you very much for watching and we will see you next time.